Um, let's just pray, and then I just want to share something in my heart this morning. So, Father, I want to thank you again for uh, the opportunity to gather. Lord, not everybody in the world can do this, and that's, Lord, that's a fact. We get to do this free of pressure and trouble, Lord. We are not sitting here trying to be silent, Lord. We're not sitting here trying to be hidden. We didn't drive here this morning unable to tell people where we were going, and yet, Lord, there are millions of your people, your children around the world that are under that sort of a circumstance, Father. So we don't want to take this for granted, God. We really appreciate the freedom that we have in this nation. We thank you for that, and we thank you for the chance to be here. Now, Lord, I just pray, God, would you open our ears to hear something that we need to hear, open our eyes to see something today that maybe we need to see. And Lord, may we walk out of here more passionate for you, more in love with Jesus, God, more uh, confident in our faith, and more hopeful about the future and what it is that you have in store for us, Father, in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Um, look, I want to I want to continue on this. Uh, we, we've been talking for a number of weeks now along the theme of redigging wells, and we've been going back and looking at uh, different aspects of the church. The Book of Acts, written by Luke, is the first thirty years of church history, uh, and there were more things that happened in the first thirty years of the church than what's written there. But for some reason, the Holy Spirit wanted these things to be recorded. And 2,000 years later, to have people like you and me still be able to remember those things, for whatever reason. And there are some things that the early church uh, engaged in. There were some attitudes and aspects of life in the early church that created, I think, the kind of environment that we see in the early church. And, and I'm sure that everybody in this room, at some point, you have read the book of Acts, the, the, this ancient document. And I'm sure that as you have flicked through the pages of that, that something in you has been drawn to that uh, uh, space. And if you're like me, I've wondered, Lord, why, did, why could you not have had me born in the Middle East around that time so I could have been a part of that, you know? Um, and God in his wisdom knows why I was born here and now, and I believe there's a time and a reason in God why I'm here today and now. And there's a time and a reason and a purpose and a plan of God why you were born now and you weren't born in 7th century China or some other place. Uh, all of us, I hope, live with this sense of, of destiny. Not only were we born at the right time and in the right place, um, but we're also in the right space in terms of the history of what God is doing on planet Earth. Uh, if, if you look to the right of you there, there's that sort of crack in the wall there, and we use this illustration quite often. I want you to imagine that time began this far end of the wall and time's going to finish way up the other end of the wall. Uh, that little crack in the wall, that's, that's being generous, but that's your life. And you've only got one of them. We've only got one of them. We don't get a second shot at this. We don't get a second chance. We don't get to get to the end of this and go, okay, I've learned so many really valuable lessons. I'm going to reprioritize my life, go back and do it again. We don't get that chance. So the earlier in life that we can begin to prioritize, Jesus said, Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God, amen? Seek first the kingdom of God is right. All these other things will be added to you. God says, don't worry about all the other stuff of life. I'm not going to rip you off. I'm not, uh, I have a plan A for your life, not a plan B, C. I've got a plan A. And if you'll seek me first and prioritize me in life, then my, I will give you plan A. I will make sure that, because I'm a good father. And a good father is not trying to keep his children from the plans and purposes of their life. He's not trying to keep his children from the blessings that he has for them. A good father is trying to guide his children to that. You know, we have this uh, birthday tradition in our, our home. Well, it's just not many of us left now, but, but maybe we should do it, you and me. We'll try it next time. But um, our kids, we'd get up in the morning and, and we'd wrap the presents and we'd hide them. And, and we would say, right, the other kid would come out and then we would begin the game. Anyone ever play the game? Hot, cold. Anyone ever play that game? Hot, cold, hot, cold. And, and the child would walk in, we'd go, oh, you're getting cold. Oh, they'd turn around. Oh, no, you're getting hot, you're getting hot, oh, getting boiling, boiling, that's it, yeah! And they pick up the present and unwrap it and so on. And so we were trying to guide them to the present that we had for them. See, it wasn't hidden from them, it was hidden for them, right? It's not hidden from them, it's hidden for them. And God has things for us, they're not hidden from us, they're hidden for us. And so God kind of guides us when we make him first in our life. As a good father, he will guide us towards those things that he has for us. He's not guiding us away from those things. But sometimes when we forget that and we try to make it all on our own and we don't prioritize first God and seek first his kingdom, what we end up doing is we end up trying to guide ourselves to things that may not be plan A for God, they may be plan B. And how many of you have ever found yourself in a place and you go, well, I, 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 all these years seeking and chasing and so on, and now I'm sitting in a place going, you know what, I, 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 still, I, I feel like I'm still not 
there. There's something in me where I, oh, I just know that I was made for something different or made for something more or this is not, this is not, I, I know that I'm not walking in exactly what I think God might have had as a plan for me. You know, it's never too late if you find yourself in that position. Seek first the kingdom of God is something that we can do at any moment. We can start because it comes back to a decision. It comes back to a choice. It's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's a choice. It's a decision that we make right now today where we go, you know what, God, I don't know if I have or I haven't, but I'm going to make the decision right now that for the rest of the days I've got, I'm going to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go after you with all my heart. I'm going to prioritize what you want me to prioritize. I'm going to go after the things you say are good. I'm going to uh, allow myself to be transformed and, and, and go after what you say and not just pursue things because the world says this is the best and that's great. And so I, I really want to get in tune with God. And so we have that opportunity in front of us, every one of us, and that can happen at any point. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, let me tell you something about getting to know Jesus. That also begins with a decision. It begins with a choice. It begins with a choice. I started following Jesus at 19 years of age. I had some circumstances in my life. My life went pear-shaped and I was empty and very, very flat and into some things that weren't helping me and I cried out to God and said, God, here's the deal. I think you're there. I wasn't even 100% convinced. I knew there was something there. So I stood on a roundabout in the middle of a highway and said, God, I think you're there. I'm pretty con- There's something there. Right? And this Jesus story makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of sense in the Jesus story. There seems to be a lot of evidence, not just in the Bible, but go back to ancient Jewish and Greek historians and Romanists. There's enough there to tell me that there's something significant about Jesus. Plus, when you find his name pop up in just about every major religion of the world, you think, there's got to be, why are you all putting him in there? There's got to be something about Jesus that's extremely special. And, and so I gave my life to Jesus at 19. Not, I didn't know anything about him. I didn't have to know who he was. I didn't have to understand everything about him. And my journey of the last 32 years, of 32 years, journey of the last 32 years of being a disciple or an apprentice of Jesus is I'm constantly growing in my knowledge of who he is and my understanding of who he is. And I'm constantly growing in my experience of God. And I'm constantly finding areas of my heart that I need to open up and surrender more and more to him because I want everything that God has for me. And like I said, that crack in the wall there, that's our life. That's the one shot that we get. And we're going to dedicate that crack to one of two things. We're going to dedicate it to ourselves and whatever we want or we're going to make the decision that we're going to dedicate it to God knowing that what's on the other side of that is going to be something that is so amazingly unfathomable this side of heaven that we're going to look back and go, you know what, it doesn't matter what sacrifices I had to make or what, 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 how it felt or what people thought of me in the process. When I get to the other side, I'm going to look and go, Pff, wow, it was worth it. Especially when you're walking around heaven and you start bumping into people who come up to you and go, you know, I want, you don't remember me, but you came in and you taught. I've got a, a lady that came in and taught an RE class when I was 11 years of age at Evans Head Public School. One day, I just remember one day, because it was Melbourne Cup Day, she was about to get really into the meat of her message to us kids, and the principal walked in and said, quiet, Melbourne Cup's on, turned on the Melbourne Cup on the TV in the <laughs> library at Evans Head. So, but you know what? Something happened that day, a seed. First time I'd ever heard of Jesus. Could have been a brand of underwear or a type of pepper for all I knew. A Jesus. I had no idea, no concept, no background. And then all of a sudden she comes in and she tells me about this guy called Jesus. And a seed was planted. I didn't germinate until I was 19, but a seed was planted. And when I get to heaven, I thankfully, praise God, fast forward 20, 15 odd years, I'm preaching in a church one day, and long story short, a friend of hers was there. I told the story. He said, I know her. I was able to connect with her. And, and, and we were able to let her know, you know what, here, Way back all those years ago, and she sobbed on the phone. A friend of hers that I was speaking to went home, rang her up. She sobbed on the phone. She said, me and my husband have just been saying to God, what is the point of our life? What have we done all these years working with these little kids? What's the fruit of it? And then all of a sudden she gets a phone call. Hey, guess what? One little kid sitting in that classroom is now pastor in a church, blah, blah, blah. That stage I'd been over to India and done missions work and all kinds of things, and that fruit hangs on her tree. So I want to get to heaven and have that. Who would like that? I want to get to heaven. I, 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 want to, I don't care if I don't reap the, I don't care if I don't sit with you and go, oh, bow your head, let's accept Jesus. But I, I, I hope and pray that God would use me to spend my whole... I'm a seed chucker. That's what I, I go and speak on YWAM schools and I tell them that's my profession. I'm a seed chucker. I just chuck seeds out there and Holy Spirit, you do what you want with the seeds. And, and so I want, to, I, want to, I want to chuck some seeds out here this morning. Um, I want to continue on with our journey of redigging wells. But I, 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 I came in this morning and I was praying... As we do Sunday morning, come on in and pray before. And I just had a few thoughts, so I'm just going to um, 
share some of those and then, then if that leads into the next well, great. If it doesn't, then we'll continue that on next week. Uh, I was at home yesterday and me and my uh, uh, wife, I, 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 we put a pool in our backyard. It's been a 12-month process. Long story short, very, very traumatised by it, but the Lord shall bring healing into my life at some point. Um, anyway, we're sitting around the pool yesterday because it was really, really hot, and so we thought, well, we'll go and jump in. Water wasn't hot, by the way. It was ice cold, unreal. Couldn't believe it. Anyway, so cold. Jumped in the pool, and I'm looking up on the fence, and on the, on the top of the fence <laughs> where we were, our neighbour's boundary fence, three mice. Who knew that mice could... Cl- did, did everyone know that mice could climb fences? I had no idea. I, I'm, I'm, I'm stunned. I'm watching this mouse vertically up the palings. Bang, three mice. And they're up on top and they're looking at us. <laughs> Do I look like a piece of cheese? They're just staring at us. It's almost intimidating. It's like, oh, I want to cover myself up or get out of the pool, whatever. These mice are staring me down from the top of the fence. They're not even that big. Anyway, I'm watching and watching and then all of a sudden two of them disappear to the edge and climb down on our side of the boundary fence. And there's this garden, so they disappear behind the garden. One stays up there, and it's almost like he was a watchman. He's up there, and he's looking the whole time. He's looking at me, and then he's looking back at where the mice are. And I don't know if they're talking or got microphones on or CB. I don't know. But they're communicating, and we're sitting there, and me and Jackie going, isn't that weird? Watch him up on the thing. Next thing, I turn around behind me, and one of them is running along the, the concrete pad towards me. And as soon as I see him, he turns around and runs back away and, and disappeared, you know? But it's not the first uh, animal that's kind of come out in the last few days. These three mice were there. I had a massive blue tongue. He's about that big. Blue tongue about that big. He lives in our rock wall, and I, I thought he was long gone, but he's about that big. And I'm sitting at home on, on, uh, on Friday. I, I usually work, try to work from home on Fridays. And I'm sitting at home on Friday on the computer, and I hear this... Dad, say it. I can hear this banging on the, at the front. So I, I get up from the computer, I walk around, and as I'm walking towards the front door, all I saw at first was this massive big head at the glass, because I got the door and this little glass panel. There's this huge head, and my first thought was, of course, snake, because I had a brown snake two weeks ago on my back veranda, brown snake. They're coming out all over the place, animals. And so this thing, and he must have seen a moth inside or something, because he's sitting there and he's tapping on the glass, you know. So I opened up the door, and of course he, he went back out, left the front door, around the garage, around the back of the house, back into his rock wall and, and, <coughs> and so on. All these animals are starting to come out and, it's, and then it kind of dawned on me, you know, it's, it's, it's spring. Spring. And all this life begins to bloom and blossom and we're seeing rabbits now coming out, out the, the back there, the ducks. We've got the little parakeets that come and rest on our back th- uh, uh, veranda and, and, and they're very bold. They'll actually, if I don't come out and we don't feed them, they go into our fly screen and just hang on the fly screen until we come out and feed them there. So all this animal life and all this stuff, all these experiences and all this new stuff is sort of uh, starting to come out uh, now. And it's like new life and and new things tend to happen in new seasons of life. Now, God's created the world in such a way that I'm a big believer that things happen in seasons. Who believes that? I believe life is season. I used to preach and tell people, you know, life's about balance and it's all... I, I, the older I've got, the more I realise that balance is not the best way to describe life. I love what uh, Ecclesiastes, you know, there's a time for this, a time for that, and so on. It's not about balance. Life's really about seasons. And if you think it's about balance, then go and tell a, a mother with four small children whose husband's working in the mines for two weeks that it's all about balance. Let me come. I want to see her punch you. Because it's very hard to balance, isn't it, a season like that where you're running around and so on. It, 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 in that, you can't balance that. But it's a season because one day your children are going to grow up And then they're going to start going to school and you'll have six hours a day free. And then one day they leave home and you're walking around in just your underpants at home with your wife. It's just the way it goes. Life is seasonal. And seasons come and seasons go. And with this particular season we're in right now in the natural, there's this real sense of new life and freshness and the flowers are, you know, all that sort of stuff and colours and smells. We used to have this uh, bubblegum tree. I don't know what it's actually called. It was a bubblegum tree in our backyard. Anyone know what a bubblegum tree is? You know what the technical name? No, I can't remember. Melaleuca pressiana. Bubblegum tree. We had a bubblegum tree, right? (laughs) I can spell bubble gum and I can spell tree. But anyway, it used to, it, 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 the flowers open up and you get this. Anyone ever buy footy cards when you're a kid and you get that stick of bubble gum? That's exactly what it smells like. 
Yeah, and it used to open up and you would get this beautiful smell. It was my favourite tree. We had to get rid of it when we put the, the pool in. It was one of the sacrifices that we made to get the pool in. But uh, I, love that. I love this season. I love this new season, this new life, this new change of things. So life is about seasons. It's not so much about balance. And, you know, we've been moving into this uh, series. This, we've been talking about redigging wells. And for me... I'm not talking about this because I feel like, hey, what a great set of teachings. Would it be great? Would you go back and come up with a topic or a, something that sounds cool or whatever? I have a real sense in my heart that we're, as a church, entering into a new season. I don't, as when I say church, I don't just mean a rise. I mean church in general in the West. We're entering into uh, a new season. There's something about the season we've been in that's laid a foundation for the season that we're going into. And there's a new season that God has coming for us. I've started praying for a revival. I've never prayed for a revival in my life. It's never been something on my heart to pray for. But I'm finding myself more and more praying for revival. And when I say revival, I'm finding myself praying. I mean, I always pray for uh, you guys that arise. That's part of what we're called to do. We, we, we pastors will pray for their, their congregations and the people that God allows them to lead, whatever. Shepherd. We pray for you. But I found myself praying for the whole church, not just the people that sit on chairs in this building. And there's this thing in my heart where I'm, I'm actually, I've been a believer for 32 years and I've seen lots of fads come and lots of fads go, I've got to be honest. I've sat through a lot of, oh, the church is moving into this and into that and so on and, you know, how many of you have been through those, you know, this was the big one that's going to change the world and this one's going to change the world and here we are in, in 2023 and the church is actually declining numerically. Not all over the world, in, in, in Asian countries and so on, it's booming. In the Western world, it's on a bit of a steady decline for various reasons. I don't want to talk about that today, but, but it is. But I am just finding myself at the moment praying for revival, praying that God, I'm starting to actually believe that there's something going on here more than I can see, taste, touch, feel or smell. There, there's something happening in the spiritual dimensions, call it whatever you want. There's something happening behind the scenes, behind the curtain, and, and God is, is blowing and God is breathing, and God is, is pushing. Um, I, I see what's going on with the young people. You know, we've got a connect group um, that meets here with um, sort of young adult age people. They've got about 17 people going to that. It's just sprung up out of nowhere in about the last six weeks. Just kind of sprung up all of a sudden. You know, here I am thinking we don't have anyone in that age bracket. We've got 16, 17 guys meeting in that age bracket now. And it's not because we've done anything fantastic or different. God's doing something. Amen? God's doing something. The Holy Spirit's doing something. And we're not making the Holy Spirit do stuff. We just recognize and we just go along with him. The minute man tries to... Man makes a terrible God. Have you ever noticed that? Man makes a terrible God. And if you go back and look at the history of revival, quite often revivals end because man then tries to pick up what God has done and thinks that we can take it from here, God, thank you very much. And we try to be God in the midst of what God is doing. And it's important that we recognise when God's doing something, recognise what he's doing, come alongside and get involved and accept the invitations, but don't ever take on board that you made this happen or, or we're so great or look what we're doing. Uh, we can't do that. We, 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 we're here to bring glory to God and to follow God, not to say, God, you get behind me now, I can take it from here. I've learned a few things, God, in my time walking with you. I'd like you to come for, come for a walk with me. Let's go. You know? Because here's the thing, if you're walking in the wrong direction, he's not going to go. He's God, you know? He's going to do his thing. So I feel like we're in this new season. There's this new thing that God's doing. Now, God doesn't force us into joining him. How many of you know that? Your Heavenly Father doesn't force you into anything. He invites us into things. He invites us. Uh, it's a choice to go with God whether it be uh, corporately or whether it be individually, what he's doing in your life. It's always a choice to follow God. It's a choice to walk with God. Psalm 103 verse 10. They don't have it because I wasn't going to share this. So if you can find it, put it up on the screen for me. Psalm 110 verse 3, sorry. It says this in the New King James. It says, your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In other words, you will choose... And this is a, a, a prophetic psalm about the Messiah, about Jesus. And, and what it's saying here is that, 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 that those that, that go with you will be people who will choose to. We will choose to. If, if you want to follow Jesus, it'll come back to choice. You, you can choose not to, or you can choose to. If you want to surrender to him, you can choose to or choose not to. And when, and when God begins to move, we can choose to go with God, or we can choose to sit on the sidelines and criticise. We can, we can choose to participate or we can choose to be a spectator. 
And, and I don't think that the kingdom was ever established by God to be filled with spectators. Amen? The kingdom is meant to be full of participants, those that want to participate with him. Um, the NIV version says, your troops will be willing on your day of battle. I love that one. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle. It tells me a couple of things. It tells me, first of all, that there is a day of battle. That, how many of you, when you came to faith, were told, you know, come to Jesus, give him your life, and, and you know, you'll get healthy, wealthy, and wise? Anyone ever hear that? You know, that was, a big, that was a big thing. That was a big message for a long time. I know around the time I got saved, that was, that was how you got somebody to come to faith, was, was you told them that their life would be better, it would be easier, everything would work for them. They would be like King Minus, and everything you touch will turn to gold. That's what we told them, okay? That's what people were hearing. And then, of course, many, many people came to faith during those times. And, of course, many, many of those people that came to faith during that time eventually realized that, hey, I wasn't told the whole story, and this was not in the brochure. How come my wife got cancer? How come I lost my job? Or, or, or how come I... Or how come we... Or why do I feel? Or why did they say... This was not in the brochure, the quote Billy Crystal in City Slickers. One of my favourite films. And, 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 and how many people's faith have been shipwrecked because the expectation that there wouldn't be battle, yet it's very, very clear that there's, there's a, a season where God will carry us, but there's a season where we fight too. Amen? There's a season where we've actually got to dig in. There's a season of commitment. And there's a season of discipline that we enter into as well. So back in the 90s, around that same time, sort of when I, I came to faith, and uh, there were lots of revivals that took place back then. You'd probably remember the Toronto Airport Vineyard back in 94, I think it was. God moved there and there was a revival and people were flying into Toronto Airport Vineyard Church from all around the world. And then there was the Brownsville Revival in Pensacola, probably two of the bigger ones, and people flew in. I've got friends of mine that flew all the way over there and went to that to sit under that and to experience that and to encounter that and so on. The positive end of that was that it was a real reminder to us that the Holy Spirit's alive and active and well that God still does miracles. Amen? Who believes in a God that can do miracles? I'll never promise you a miracle, but I'll promise you this. The God you follow can do it. He can do them. He does that stuff. That's what makes him God. It's his prerogative. So we had this real awakening of the presence of the Holy Spirit, this real awakening of the power of God, that, that the power of God is real, that, 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 that religion is not just a, a stagnant philosophy. It's not just a way of thinking. It's not just a great moral code and a way to bring your children up. There's life to what God... You know, Jesus said, I won't leave you as an orphan. The Spirit's going to come. He said, I've got to go. If I don't, the Spirit won't come. So we have this very real, active, living relationship with God through his Spirit that dwells within us each and every day. That was the good out of it. Probably the negative out of it was that we became very feelings-oriented. The church became very feelings-oriented. It was all about feelings. It was all about what I'm seeing. If I'm not seeing something, I'm not feeling it, well then I'm going to either uproot and go to some other church where I'm seeing and I'm feeling, or at the end of the day I'll go, oh, well, maybe that was just all emotional hype and maybe I just, and it wasn't really God, God's not real. And so people walked away from God. Because how many of you know that sometimes we're not feeling? Yeah? Sometimes you just don't feel it. Yeah? I don't always have the feels for God. Isn't that a trendy term that people use now? Get the feels? See it in the movies? Am I, am I quoting it wrong? No comment? Sometimes, sometimes the feelings aren't there. And sometimes it's not about, uh, uh, you know... There are some days where I wake up and if it was on a feeling scale, I'd probably go, am I even a believer? I'm feeling pretty whack today. This ain't cool, you know? But it's not about feelings. And sometimes seeing. Am I seeing things? You know, I've, I've been uh, saved for 32 years and I went through seasons in my life where I saw God do miracles and amazing things in the space of a heartbeat. Lives transformed, healings, miracles, people that have been bedridden for 10 years, jumping up, eyes opened up, uh, seen all kinds of things that happened in a heartbeat. But then there are other things that, are, that, that have taken 5, 10, 15, 20 years to slowly germinate, even in my own life. You know, recently I've been, 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 been uh, myself, currently, I've been talking to a counsellor about things from my own childhood, that finally 30 years on in my journey of walking with the Lord, finally God's gone, now's a good time to talk about it. I'm like, God, why didn't you let me? Because I've got other friends that had similar stuff, and God, you did miracles for them, and they were just emotionally set free. Why have I got to go through all this process and talk? I don't want to talk to people about it. Just, just touch me, Lord, just do it. So no, 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 your journey's different. You're going to go and you're going to talk to somebody and we're going to unpack some things. And it's been amazing. It's been really freeing for me. 
But the positive of those revivals has been the evidence of the Spirit, but the negative is that we begin to get so focused on feelings and stuff, and when things aren't happening, we wonder, where is God? Is there something wrong with me? Is there something wrong with the church I go to, the fellowship I'm a part of? Is, is, is God not here? However, the truth is this. The fertile soil of revival, it's cultivated by the commitment and discipline of God's people when they may not be feeling or seeing anything. It's what we do in those moments. It's the commitment we show to the Lord when we don't feel like it. It, it, It's our ability to keep walking with Jesus when we feel like we're not seeing nothing. It's our ability to believe when there's nothing there evidenced in front of us to actually believe. And what I'm convinced of is every move of God, when you see what the Holy Spirit does, those moves of God, we think they just sprung up out of nowhere. We just think that that somebody added water and there was a dehydrated or rehydrated revival and boom, there it is. But usually it's on the back of faithful, committed believers who have continued to walk faithfully with God, who've continued to pray faithfully, who've continued to wake up every day, put their feet on the ground and go, I am not my own, I've been bought with a price and today I'm going to live that way. I'm going to today walk and give glory to God. It's been built on the back of faithful people who have committed to, to surrender all of their life every day to get up, to face challenges. It's, it's been built on the back of people that have fallen off the horse, but when they fall off, they get back up, they accept the forgiveness of God, they realise that God, God knows we're human. He knows we're imperfect. He's not expecting perfection of us this side of heaven. It's not going to happen. But that doesn't mean that we take that grace for granted and we just go on doing whatever we want knowing that some of the things we're walking in and doing aren't his best for us. That's not what it means. We discipline ourselves. Paul talks about, I beat my body, I bring it into subjection. It literally means in the Greek, I give myself a black eye just to remind myself, hey, you are not your own. You belong to God and you gave your life to Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul says this. He says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. Walk by faith and not by sight. So what I want to do, close this out. I want to go back and just quickly recap what we've been talking about. Because here's what I think. I think God, I think the Spirit is wanting to do something. I think we're on the edge of something that the Holy Spirit wants. And we're already seeing it. We're already seeing little bits and pieces of what the Holy Spirit's doing. I'm not saying it's just happening here. But again, the evidence of the Spirit working is not people bursting out in tongues and loud prophetic utterances and falling over when they're prayed for. The evidence of the move of the Holy Spirit is what's happening in a person's heart. Are they being more passionate? Are they being drawn to Jesus? That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do at the end of the day. He doesn't want to just put a show on for people. Come along on Sunday, pay your entry fee. We'll call it tithes and offerings. Pay your entry fee. We'll get out, put on a little bit of music for you and then God will put on a show. That's, That's never been what God has done. It's never been the plan of God. The evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life is not stop looking outwardly, look inwardly. Is your heart getting more and more aligned with the will of God? Are you getting more and more passionate for Jesus? Is there something in you that's drawing you to the Father? Drawing you to the Word of God? Drawing you to prayer? When, when you want to go off on your own tangent, is that conviction of the Holy Spirit, that voice of the Spirit inside getting louder and louder, or has the Spirit given up because you're just going to do your own thing anyway? That's evidence of the move of the Holy Spirit. That's evidence. And I think that's what God wants. We've seen all kinds of revivals with all kinds of fancy external displays. And do I love them? You bet I do. I love it when, when I see people healed. I love it. It, it's great. I love seeing the works of the devil being usurped by the power of God. I love that. I love seeing people delivered. I love seeing. I love the evidence of the things I can see. But I think I grow more when I step into commitment and faithfulness in light of things I'm not seeing, and I keep walking with God. And so we've been doing this redigging wells thing, and here's what I feel like. I feel like redigging wells. I feel like going back and looking at these things. It's, it's our commitment to going back to some of these things and going, I'm, I'm, I'm going to walk in these things. I'm going to make these things part of my Christian journey. I'm going to walk in the things. Because if I want to see what the early church saw, I want to be who the early church were. I want God to have the same accessibility to my heart that these guys gave him back then. Because if we're brutally honest, we've somewhat moved away from that over 2,000 years, whether it's we think we're more theologically wiser than they were or more, uh, you know, we're, we're smarter or we've got more, uh, you know, they didn't have a big building and flashy lights and sound systems, but we do. They didn't, you know. 
Maybe we feel like we're, we've got more things at our fingertips. But the truth of the matter is we've probably got more things to depend on, whereas back then maybe they didn't have all that and they had to have faith in God. And that's what happens in the midst of a persecuted space is people realise, I, I need God because nothing else works. And maybe we've relaxed a bit on that and we think we've got all these other things and we're really skillful and great and we've got TVs and we've got money and we've got all this stuff and so we can make it on our own. So part of what I feel like God's saying is this redigging wells. For, and this, for those of you that call this place home, you know what I'm talking about. If you're visiting today, you probably don't know the journey we've been on. So my apologies. Um, but we've been going through this series of redigging wells. And, and in a nutshell, we're just looking at what were some of the, 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 the things that the early church d- drank from. What were some of the spaces they drank from? Because wherever you drink from, you get what's in that well. And so we've looked at some of these things. So I just, here's what I want to do with the remaining time today. I want to recap just very briefly. I'm going to ask you some questions. We've covered five wells. Now, for the next five minutes, I want you to think. Those of you that call this place, I want you to think. And I don't want you to think whether, oh, that was a good teaching or a bad teaching. I enjoyed that week or I didn't enjoy that week. I don't want you to think that. What I want you to do is genuinely ask yourself, am I... Am I drinking from that? Have I gone back? Was I, was I convinced enough from the word of God that, hey, yeah, that's a genuine well? Because it's not what we know that transforms us, it's what we do. Jesus made it very clear. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do the things I'm saying? Why? Blessing is found in obeying God. It's found in walking in the truth as we understand it, as we know it, walking in the truth of God. And from, from Genesis to Revelation, I don't understand it, I don't get it. But what I do know is this, there seems to be this innate blessing that comes upon obedience. It just does. I don't, I, don't ask me to explain it all, I can't. I just know I see it from the beginning to the end of the book. When we obey God and walk in the things of God, even if culture doesn't like it, even if our friends don't like it, even if it cost me uh, 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 this or it cost me that, it cost, you know, I, I know this. I know that walking in obedience always releases something really good into my life and that something really good is something really God. And so, so I just want to recap those five worlds and I want you to, to ask yourself because I, I don't want to just go through this as, hey, he's just a great teaching. This, 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 this I believe, is that fertile soil that I was talking about. It, the obedience and the commitment to following God and doing what God wants, that creates the fertile soil upon which revival springs out of. So I want you to just think. Here's, here's the five wells we've covered so far. First one, we covered the well of God's presence and power. What have you, what have, what have you done with that? If you've been here on this journey with us, what have you done with that? See, the early church understood the presence of God was with them 24-7, not just when they came to church on a Sunday. The presence of God was with them, not just when they walked into a temple. Most of the miracles in the New Testament take place outside the walls of one of these buildings. The Holy Spirit was with them when they went to work, when they go and do the grocery shopping, when they played sport. Not only was the presence of the Spirit with them, but the power. Because if you get the Spirit, you get everything that's attributed. You get the power of the Spirit as well. So they didn't, they, they, they didn't have to feel the need to... You know, you, you're filled with the Spirit. You have the power and the presence of God in your life. You can pray. You can seek God. You can share the good news with somebody and God can use your words. You, you, you can offer to pray for somebody that's going through a hard time. There, there, there are things that we can do, all of us. You don't have to be anybody special. I love in Acts chapter 8, it talks about... Uh, Acts chapter... Is it 8? Yeah, it is. Acts chapter 7, Stephen gets martyred in Acts chapter 8. It begins by saying a great persecution broke out and all the believers scattered except the apostles. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem. Everybody else scattered. All the nameless, faceless people that we have no idea who they were. It says they scattered and it says and everywhere they went they preached Jesus. Everywhere they went. They preached. Why? Because they believed the presence and power of God was with them. So the will of God's presence and power, what have you done with that? What, what, how, how does that impact your life? Let me ask you a question. I preached it about eight weeks ago. Has it had any impact on your life? Or has it just been another week we've ticked? It's another one of the 52. It's another great topic. Let's move on. Or are you living with a greater awareness of the presence and the power of God in your life? The second well we looked at was the well of the prayer of faith. It wasn't the well of prayer. Because we can pray for purely therapeutic reasons. It makes us feel good to pray. Because when we pray, we feel like we're doing something about something which we feel like we can't do anything about, so I'll just pray. But, uh, but the early church prayed in faith. They actually prayed with faith. They believed. 
They believed that when they prayed, when they opened their mouth and spoke to God, they believed that God was there with them. They believed that the God, the creator of heaven and earth, listened to the words that came out of their mouth and that that God took those words and that God went and did stuff. Things changed. Things moved. Things shifted. Prayer was not just a therapeutic activity to make us feel good. Prayer had power. And they prayed with faith. And 2,000 years later, people of all religions pray. In fact, therapists will actually sit you on their lounges and in their counselling sessions, therapists will tell you to pray. Not to Jesus, they don't care because they understand the therapeutic value of prayer. But we as believers, are you praying in faith? What are you praying for? Are you praying? Who are you praying for? If we pray in faith, if, if, if God is real and prayer is powerful, and we pray in faith, at least we give God the opportunity to, to move on our behalf. And to do, I'm not saying, oh, I believe God answers every prayer. He might not answer the way you want, but he answers prayer. I don't always get what I want. And Paul didn't get what he wanted. Lord, take this thought away from me. And he said, no, 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 my grace is sufficient for you. Got an answer, just wasn't the one he wanted. But he was happy because God answered the prayer. Are we praying in faith? What impact has that had on you? The third one was the well of spiritual awareness. The reality of the fact that, you know what? We wrestle not with flesh and blood. But there are powers and principalities out there. There's a, there's a realm. There's a realm. And there's a battle going on. And we wrestle. What does it look like? I don't know. You, I'm not trying to explain to you. All I know is this, that it's very clear that there is, there's this spiritual dimension to life. There's a dimension we can't see, taste, touch, feel or smell. And there's activity going on and it's as real as this natural world that we're walking in right now. Are we living with that awareness? Every time you have an argument with your wife or your husband or your best friend or your workmate or your colleague or your boss, do you turn around and get mad at them or do you ever step back and go, hang on, is there something more happening here? Could there be something going on in the unseen realm here? Maybe instead of, Jackie's not my enemy, but I do have an enemy and maybe what I need to be doing is praying this way instead of arguing this way. And that can be for any number of scenarios in our life. The early church knew there was a spiritual awareness. That's why Paul said to them, hey, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but we, we do wrestle. He said, pray, pray without ceasing. There are, there are things we can do in that space of battle. Are you aware of that? Or, you, or, or do we just drift straight back to our natural default setting, which is to blame the world, blame our boss, blame our kids, blame the government, blame this, blame that, everything, without any attention to the thought that, hey, maybe there's something else going on here. Maybe there's something else going on here. The fourth well we looked at was the well of radical obedience. Radical obedience. Where has radical obedience gone in the church today? Surely God wants to do a little bit more. I think he does. We're the radically obedient people. We've replaced radical obedience with rational obedience. God, I'll do that, but before I do, you've got to make sense to me first so that I can then decide whether I'm going to obey you or not. You know? And God says to his disciples, Jesus says, there's a donkey, go and steal the donkey, untie it. And if anyone says, what are you doing? Say, ask for Jesus. And they go and do it. I'm thinking, well, hang on, Jesus, you tell me first. Does that guy know I'm going to grab that donkey first? Do they actually know? Do they know that we're with, like, have you sent someone ahead of you? Clear, have you done, you know? March around the wall seven times and each, you know, on the last day, march around seven times and go, <laughs> the wall's going to fall. I'm going, hang on, God, you want me to tell this couple of million people this is the plan? Are you serious? I don't know. But we seem to have all these stories of these radically obedient people. You know? The disciples are in prison and the chains fall off and the doors open up and what do they do? The angel says, go straight back into the temple, smack bang into the lion's mouth and start preaching again. And so they do. I'm not doing that. I'm going, thanks for the freedom, dude. I'm out of here. Because that makes no sense. Do we live with rational obedience or radical obedience? Could be young people in this room today and the Lord may speak to you and say, I want you to go to missionary, go and be a missionary in China. I want you to go to Africa, preach the gospel. I want you to go and work with lepers in India. Would you be okay with that? More to the point, would our parents be okay with that? Because again, we live in a world now where as parents, no, 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 we want you to get a college education and buy a... All, uh, is there any thought that, hey, what if God has a different plan? Are we prepared to be obedient? Are we encouraging obedience? Or is everything just so rational these days and so controlled? I wonder. And the last one was the well of Christian fellowship. The well of Christian fellowship. What difference does that make to us? The early church 
had a real good grip on what fellowship actually was. And it wasn't just a bunch of religiously minded people meeting for an hour and a half on a Sunday in the same place. They did life together. Hey. <laughs> That's okay, you can sneak up here. It's all good. They understood that fellowship is more than just gathering together in a room with religiously like-minded people. Fellowship is not just gathering, but it's gathering for a purpose. What's our purpose? We're on a purpose together. What's our purpose? Our purpose is to glorify God in the earth. Our purpose is to grow in our apprentices under Jesus to become disciples and followers so that we can turn around and apprentice other people, disciple other people, make a difference and point other people, not to ourselves, but to point them to Jesus Christ. The, the, the purpose of community is more than just that. It's, 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 it's getting involved in each other's world. It's being humble before one another. It's about giving grace to one another, doing life together. It's about serving one another, helping one another. It's about being accountable to one another. That's something we hate. Nobody wants to be accountable to somebody else. I'll just keep my stuff to me. No, no, no. We grow by being accountable to one another. And we head in the same direction and we're, 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 we're doing something together. Uh, fellowship was not about just being together. It's about going somewhere together as well. That's how the early church understood it. And that's the next one we'll move on to next week. I haven't got time for it now. But I just want to ask you the question. Th these things we're talking about, uh, what, what difference are they making to you? Because he here's the reality. I don't understand. I'll just be brutally honest. Can I, can I be brutally honest? Most of you know my heart. I just don't get why... I don't get why anyone would give up a Sunday morning, especially beautiful weather like this, to come and hear preaching out of this book, but not want to do any of it. I don't get it. I'm not saying I'm there, because I'm exactly the same. I'm speaking this to me as well. And this is the challenge. This is the challenge. Because as time goes on, that separator between those who are actually serious and want to be disciples and want to go on with God and want to prioritise the Lord with that little crack in the wall called life and those that don't is going to get wider and wider and wider and wider and wider. Because the spaces where we all played together have disappeared and they're going to continue to disappear. And at some point, we're all going to be confronted with either I'm all in or I'm all out. I'm all in for Jesus or I'm all out. We, 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 we have this culture in Western Christianity, unfortunately, where you know, there's a lot of grain. A lot of, and look, I'm not saying there's no grace. There is grace. Okay? There is grace. And I'm not, not trying to paint some black and white heroes and villains type thing. I'm not saying that. But I don't just want to be a Christian. I want to be a disciple. And I want to make a difference. Amen? I want to make a difference. I've got one crack at this. I'm 51 doesn't seem old to people like Owen and Rod but it may seem old to some of you younger people and I'll tell you what happened like that one day I'm running around playing sport and killing it and the next day I took one step to run and I felt like it killed me and you know I had to get up there this morning to get the cajun down I said to the boys I, I can't it's that much of a gap that's all to jump up I, you know what five years ago I would have jumped up pulled myself up I said I can't risk it I don't think I could do it my brain's saying, don't do it, because if you fall, once upon a time, it would have taken you a week to get better. It'll take you 10 weeks. You're in a wheelchair. Your wife's going to be looking after you. Don't do it to her. So I had to get the boys to lift me like that, you know. But it goes really quick. It goes really fast. And I don't know how many times in a life we get to be in the middle of something that the Holy Spirit wants to do. I think he's doing things all the time. But there are kairos moments in God where the Spirit blows in a certain direction and I've had a couple of opportunities in my life so far to be in the middle of those. One or two. One or two. Once in India and one in Brisbane. And I have that stirring again that God's about to blow. That this, He is blowing gently, but there's something that he wants to do. And I want to give my whole heart to that. Amen? And I hope you do too. Anyway, for those of you visiting, that was a little different than our regular Sunday, but came in this morning, I just really felt like that's, that was on my heart for today. So, Father, I want to thank you for uh, this morning. God, thank you for, uh, Lord, the opportunity to gather again. Lord, thank you for your church. Lord, we love your church. God, all parts of the church. Father, those that are meeting in big buildings, those that meet in small buildings, those that meet in homes. God, it doesn't matter where they meet. Father, they're your children. They're part of the body, and we're attached to that. God, we're joined to them. 
So Father, we thank you for the body of Christ. And God, I thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for what you are doing in our community, here in Arise, but also beyond that, Father, you are doing amazing and wonderful things. And Lord, thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for the gift of life. We woke up today because your grace was upon us. We got to breathe and come into this place. Your grace and favour is upon us. And Father, I just pray, Lord, as we continue next week, we'll keep going on with these wells. But Lord, I pray today, Lord, would you just speak to us? Would you speak to our hearts, Father? Are we, are we embracing some of this stuff? Are we looking at your word? Are we going, yes, that's true. That, that makes sense. I see that. But are we taking the next step and going, right, yeah, what does it mean to me now, God? Holy Spirit, speak to me. Show me how I bring that into my world and I start drinking from that same well so that I can begin to see some of the things that the early church saw and experienced as well, Father. So God, I just want to thank you for your love and your favour, your grace upon every person here. Lord, I pray in the next seven days when we leave this place, give every one of us the opportunity. At some point, God, there are so many people out there that don't know you. Give every one of us the opportunity in the next seven days to bump into somebody who doesn't know you, who doesn't know that you died for them, doesn't know that you love them, and give us the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus with somebody out there that doesn't know it at this point, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 God bless you guys.